I promise you, you've never seen a guitar like this. Maybe if I ever get it done, I'll get to see it. Hello, my name is Chad, at Metalhead Maker on most socials. This is the sixth video in a guitar build series like I'm guessing you have never seen, unless you've seen the first five videos. But if you haven't, you should go watch those first and then come back to this one. Just a super quick recap on where we're at. This is a fully 3D printed guitar. Yes, that includes the neck. And it's got a lot of electronics in it. I mean, it's got its own motherboard, LEDs all the way up the neck. Eventually, I want to be able to have it be able to tune itself with motors on the tuners. I'm building in a bunch of expansion options because I don't want to just stop there. This has been a rough month for the project, so let's start out a little bit light. I needed to get the pickup wired up and installed. Up until this point, I was just using a cheap pickup that was wired directly to the output with no controls. I'm excited to switch over to an EMG81 in the bridge with a volume and a kill switch. This is actually the first time that I've wired up a kill switch, and I thought it was actually going to give me some problems like popping or something like that, but shockingly, once I got it all hooked up, it just works. I mean, there's, there's no special wiring needed. Cool. I actually really like how I've got the guitar components all mounted into the body. The pickup is direct mounted onto the body. I did not want to deal with any screws or anything like that though. So I took some really dense foam and put it inside the cavity. And then I 3D printed a little ring that goes around the pickup perfectly. And once I press that down, it holds it in place and clamps the pickup in and it works flawlessly. The volume knob and the kill switch get screwed into this plate that then gets screwed into this lower half of the body. So let me explain this a little better. If you've watched the other videos on this guitar build so far, you've probably seen that I've talked about having LEDs on not only the neck, but also the body. So I can have the bulk of the electronics and components on the underside part of the body. And then the face of the body will go on top of it. And that's where, you know, the LEDs will show. We're teetering into the design side of things. And I do want to keep some of that for the final unveiling of the guitar. So what you're going to see here is the layout of how I've got the LEDs wired up. And then it'll make a lot more sense whenever everything comes together. The bulk of the LEDs on the body is going to be on the flat parts of the face. So I just have a few trays that have LEDs pressed into them that I can then wire all together. Permission to complain for a moment. This is one of the most tedious wiring jobs I've ever done. Because of the chaotic nature of how everything's laid out, I have to measure each individual wire and then cut that, strip it, and solder each one on press it down, and then make sure everything's glued and pressed in so it fits inside the body. The second one here still does not have any wiring on it because it's taking so long to do. I toyed around the idea with getting a PCB with these. At what point is it no longer you building it? You're just sending it out to get it all manufactured. Knowing that I've got that split, I want to be able to take the top off and I'll have to disconnect the LEDs, but everything else should still be attached to the guitar. If you're at all familiar with CAD software or 3D modeling, you're probably familiar with the complexity creep problem that you have as things kind of grow and expand in scope. I don't know that I could necessarily build it better a second time, but I know for a fact that this got really complicated and it felt like it didn't need to be that way. I'm too far in though to just tear it down and rebuild it. Well, I shouldn't say that. I've done that before too. So I built the light trays around all of that complex geometry, which isn't the end of the world, but when I sandwich everything together, it's just a really tight fit in certain areas where I've got a lot of stuff going on. So far, I've been able to make it work, but there's a couple spots that I'm a little worried about and I'm just gonna have to pay close attention when I go to smoosh everything together. In part four, I went super deep into the power routing stuff, but we're actually gonna build the battery now. And that sounds kind of funny probably. How do you build a battery? Well, I could buy some kind of prepackaged battery, but why when we can make one? Even though I'm not going into all the details on how I route power, I should point out that I'm using a battery that is gonna to be totaling about 12 volts. And I need that because I need nine volts at least for the pickup. Each one of these 18650 batteries gives you about 3.7 volts, give or take, depending on how much it's charged up. So even if I put two of these in there, I wouldn't be able to hit that nine volts. So I need to step up to the next one, which just means that I need three of these instead of two giving me somewhere in the range of 12 volts. At least for DC power, it's moderately forgiving, so you can kind of be up or lower than the actual voltage you need, and within a reasonable range, it'll tolerate it, depending on the type of component, I should say, because as you'll see here shortly, I have one component that is very intolerant of voltage changes. Back on topic, there's a couple ways you can connect batteries to make them do different things. If you want them to last longer, you connect them in parallel, which is just connecting all the positives and then connecting 
connecting all the negatives together, and that'll give you the same voltage, but a higher capacity overall. However, if you connect them in series, which means you connect the positive to the negative in a daisy chain, that results in a higher voltage, but roughly the same capacity. For the geeks out there, I say roughly because, you know, we're starting at like 12 volts, but we're gonna be stepping it down to five volts, so you need less amperage. You get where I'm going with this. We're just daisy chaining batteries, so none of this is really a big deal. I will say though, when you're thinking about something else and then you accidentally touch a positive to a negative that was not supposed to touch. Ouch. Let's just say that's a good way to restore your concentration. Once you've got all those batteries daisy chained, you can't just hook them up to just like a 12 volt source and charge it perpetually. They will explode. Instead, you need something. You know what? Hold on a second. Uh, nope, yep, that or. You're gonna need something like this. These are specifically for 18650 lithium ion batteries. This is for three batteries. This is just for one battery. Once I connected this, it did not work right out of the box. I spent over an hour trying to troubleshoot this. Eventually I stumbled on a post somewhere where someone said, to make this work the first time, if there's no charge, you have to actually run a charge to it first to get it to sort of boot up. I don't know what kind of sadistic engineer came up with that idea, but I connected the power and sure enough, bam, it worked first time. You know, I've got electrical tape kind of surrounding the areas to make sure that nothing's touching that shouldn't, but I did want to encase the whole thing in something like a shrink wrap. So I bought a shrink wrap that was appropriate for a 18650 form factor, but I didn't take into account that I had the BMS on top of the battery, so it didn't fit. I had to do something funny where I flipped the batteries on their side and shrink wrapped in the wrong direction. In the end though, it kind of worked and I'm fine with that. I got the battery pack all ready to go and I go to plug it in and I'm like, wait a minute, I've got a battery in and a battery out port on my motherboard. But the connectors on this module are both an out and an in. So now I got to think through what is the impact of just connecting this on one side because I don't want to connect it to both. That would be weird, I think. I don't know, I get really turned around. There's a lot of things to keep track of. All screw ups aside, I've got a working battery pack that my guitar now runs off of, kind of. I've not tried to charge the battery yet. Maybe it doesn't work at all and I got to figure out how to route that battery out. Baby steps. I'm trying, okay? I'm new to this stuff. So overall, the power stuff's looking pretty good. The rules state though that you cannot have two things go right in a row. So with the battery out of the way, I've kind of got everything that I need to do sort of an end-to-end -end test for the most part. There's a little bit of overlap here from the last video. This is where I realized that I had a bunch of EMI or electromagnetic interference from the RGB LEDs that I had on the neck of the guitar. So I took the opportunity to add some shielding to those wires and I like to use this stranded aluminum mesh and that works really good except for the fact that I forget that I have to deal with this. I think you can probably figure out where this is going. Yep, I burned out another teensy. So that's one, two, three, and now four. This one's good. I'm sure this comes off as careless. I. I don't like spending this money. To some extent, I've accepted that this is prototyping. You've got a lot of moving parts and you're one person, so there are gonna be mistakes, but that doesn't mean you keep making the exact same mistake over and over. So I devised a plan. If I have to work in such volatility, I need to be able to account for that. So rather than risk a $40 teensy every single time I plug this in, how about I make an adapter for something much cheaper? a Raspberry Pi Pico. It's a super cheap microcontroller that has a decent amount of power for the cost. In no way is it close to the Teensy, but it's good enough that I can do a lot of testing on it, and then when I'm sure I've got everything worked out, I can switch back over to the Teensy. Now, why don't I use something like our Arduino Nano, which is arguably even cheaper than the Pico? Well, that is five volt tolerant, and that's a problem when I'm trying to make sure that I've got everything dialed in to be 3.3 volt tolerant, so when I plug in the Teensy, it doesn't go boom again. The Pico checks off every box except for the number of pins, so I just strategically chose pins that were going to be important to test and I routed those to match the Teensy's layout. And this works because even though you may be dealing with different speeds or maybe some slightly different functionality built in, a microcontroller is a microcontroller if you're dealing with the same development environment. So yeah, once I worked out a few bugs, I was able to plug this in and it operated just like the Teensy. And it's a great thing that I did this because that allowed me to test some of the other components. When I designed the control panel header, I wanted to make sure that I had some options in case for some reason I found out that I did actually need five volts and 
not just 3.3 volts going out to the control panel. So I had a few pins for both. Turns out I was using five volts for the button. So every time I would tap a button, it would shoot five volts to the digital pins on the Teensy or the Pico. I love these videos because I get to tell you for 10 or 15 minutes how much of a moron I am. So one burnout Pico later, but not a burnout Teensy, I am now at least reporting the correct voltage on all of the pins. There's a good chance that I might end up using a Pico for this project in the end if I'm able to expand the adapter enough to allow for the right number of pins with something like a pin extender. That's a whole nother topic, so let's not go there today. Okay, so we're getting to the point now where everything is starting to come together, but the videos become very difficult to start and stop at a particular point. I'm gonna call it done for the day, but the next video is just gonna be a continuation of building out the lighting for the box Body and also probably reassembling it. Maybe, we'll see. Anyway, what do you guys wanna see in these videos? Do you want me to go a little more high level? Do you want me to go deeper in topics? Maybe even make a long form video where I kinda of go super deep into one area? Hop down to the comments so we can chat about that and I will be back soon for the next one.